You ever go to one of those uh, art shows or something like that, furniture shows where the true experts are kind of showing off their work and just look at the finishes they're doing. They got light reflecting off of these work pieces, a little glistening, a little depth to the work. It's just unbelievable. And they're just using basic oils and waxes. Whereas most of us out there trying to get that semi-gloss finish, we're having to turn to some kind of film, a poly or something like that. You ever wonder how they're doing that one? Look here, this is as good as I can get a board with a hand plane, which traditionally is going to give you better results than sandpaper. I mean, I have my hand plane taking the thinnest of shavings and still being able to get some work done. I'm not gonna go super thin because I don't have to, I don't wanna sit here forever. But as I work my way across, you can see it's nice, smooth. I don't have very many tear out. I don't have many tra plane tracks or anything like that on an average box or a, or a drawer or something like that. I would pretty much go straight to finishing on something like that most times. But there's got to be a reason why my work is not turning out as good as those pros. Can you see the light reflecting off of that? Well, here's the secret. And this is not something that's unique to hand tool furniture making. I see the same tricks being used in the wood turning world, in the green carving world, all that kind of stuff. Once you are satisfied with the surface, I'm just getting rid of a few plane tracks I saw in the reflection. Well, think about this. As much time as you spent at any one setting, I'm on my fine thin setting right here, you need to spend the same amount of time burnishing your work. Grabbing some shavings. This is traditionally what you would see people would do. Just a handful of shavings and sit here and just kind of put some pressure and friction on it. I'm just going to do it on half of this board right here so you can see the results. This is pecan. Fairly hard wood in Texas. We call it pecan concrete down here. But once I get a little heat into it and get some motion on it going in all different directions, do you hear the sound change? Notice the cathedrals on this board. So this is the direction I'm laying fibers down. So that's going with the grain. So if you listen to the sound as I go forward and backwards, they're slightly different. I find it uh, the pitch is a little higher going this way than this way. Now we go in circles. Here it changes, and I can actually feel a difference coming through. And you just sit here and work it, creating heat and pressure. If you're going over an entire tabletop, this might take you just as long as it took to plane it. Now notice I did it just on one side. If you look at the light reflecting off of it now, On this side, which I haven't burnished, you still see a few plane tracks. That could be my blade isn't sharp enough, or I have a little debris on the bottom of the plane, so you're just seeing fiber, the movement of the hand plane going across. But on this side, you don't. Here's another thing. I want you to listen to it, okay? See, this side has more resistance on my finger. They're both smooth, but this is much smoother. Once again, this is not unique to hand tool furniture making. You see the same thing being done in the wood turning world and in the uh, uh, hand carving world. I'm basically burnishing the fibers and I really don't know how to explain what's happening at the uh, at the cellular level here because in a previously tips video I've talked about bruising the wood we are in in fact bruising the very top layer but when you're burnishing for some reason it doesn't affect oil absorption differently it just lays it down flatter you're not going to see the lines that a bruised fiber does, but bruised fiber goes down into the wood. It crushes the cells. We're evenly crushing them. If anybody can figure out a way to explain it better down below. 
But let me show you how we do that on the lathe. Now the concept of burnishing, as I said, you know, it doesn't really matter what type of woodworking you're doing. The wood doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know if it's being spun at 3000 RPMs or clamped on a workbench. It's all how the blades interact with the fibers. And in this case, uh, whatever we're using to burnishing is acting as a blade of sort, I guess. So, real quickly, let me round this out. Okay, now I'm going to smooth it out with a skew. Okay, let's take a look at it. And let me kind of figure out how to get the lighting so we can see the grain. Okay, I think that's pretty good. You can see I started planting it here. I left it rough over here. So this is the smooth part and if you can hear it. There we, there we go. <laughs> Don't know how else to show that how smooth it is. But I'm going to pick half of that and basically, if you've ever watched wood turners, a lot of times they will just reach down, grab some shavings, turn their lathe on to a fairly high speed, and just kind of press down on that. They might, you know, as you're going over the full thing, just a little bit, creates a little heat. Now, can you see the light reflecting difference from about right there over? I'll stop it. You can get a better, maybe get a better idea. See, it's really shiny right there, and then it dulls a little bit more here, and then gets really dull back here, because that's a rough, that's just the skew, and that is burnish. I'll burnish the rest of it now, and see if that makes it, shows it even better. So I'm putting some pressure down. This is generating heat. And there we go. Now the light reflects all the way back until the point where my roughing gouge was using and I switched to the skew. So that's burnishing. Now the reason why I want to talk about this here is because a lot of y'all have noticed that I burnish with steel also. So here we go. I will come over and you see me turn these sections. This is when I'm going across the grain. Now, whenever I'm burnishing with the steel, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm just placing the steel on the on there. The blade is totally off, and I'm not pressing, really pressing down. I'm just kind of letting it glide over it. And I can do that one because I don't really have too many hard bevels. If you've ever seen me sharpen, a lot of times I come back and on a fairly high grit, I will just kind of round over the back a few strokes like that to take away that hard edge. So now if I just press ever so slightly, I'm not really pressing, I'm just kind of gliding. I'm using the steel as a way to burnish it. And now we get some light on it and you can see how the light reflects off of it. And that kind of clicked with me that I used different materials other than just wood shavings to burnish to get the, that gloss effect. When I was watching a spoon carver, because for the first time I saw somebody, they picked up a small rock, a highly polished rock, and on the inside of a, of a wooden spoon that they just carved with a knife, they started just kind of running the rock around pressing it in and they spent a good amount of time on the inside of that spoon uh, to make it smooth and they were saying that you can feel the difference on your lips as you're pulling food the spoon out of your mouth and that burnishing was the key aspect to creating a quality spoon sensation in his mind because the very last thing somebody does with a spoon that you made is pull it out of their mouth that is the final judgment they have of the quality of your work so he was really adamant about burnishing spoons. I've seen other people take, you know, their shavings and work it in with a thumb, but that was the first time I'd some, seen somebody use a rock, kind of how 
I use the back of my uh, spindle gouge with that. Now, some of you out there might say, most woodworkers nowadays don't use a plane or a blade for their finishing cuts. Even spoon carvers and stuff like that, a lot of times they will carve the whole thing and they will hit it with sandpaper. Well, that's the same thing. You might not have shadings available to you, but you have other things. And that's kind of where I think the brown paper bag trick came about for people that maybe sanded the top of their work so they didn't have shavings to grab to, so they grabbed the closest equivalent, a brown paper bag, to do the burnishing. Bringing all this up to say that if you're really wanting to take your work to the next level to get that smooth sheen you see in those art galleries, maybe spend a little bit of time before you do your finishing, burnishing, whether with shavings, or some other tool, or even just a brown paper bag. Try it on one or two products to see if it makes any difference for you. Because I can tell you now that on my turnings, it really does. I need to start applying that same principle on my furniture. But the last thing I want to leave you with is, remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create new things, and share them with others. Y'all be safe and have fun. Oh. And if anybody can explain to me what burnishing is doing on the cellular level, not just bruising the wood evenly, leave that down in the comments below. Maybe some way I can explain it better. Okay, for today's bonus, I want y'all to go check out a YouTube channel. It's Japanese Architecture, Wisdom of Our Ancestors. I'll put a link down below. This is obviously not an English channel. I think this is somebody that uh, works at a construction site rebuilding a lot of the ancient Japanese stuff because it's not they're not using just old style Japanese tools. They're using modern power tools but creating the same joinery. It's just a really cool watch. Most of the videos are fairly short so you can kind of just escape and just I like watching when trying to say how do they do that one? Especially some of those joineries. It just amazes me. Again, there'll be a link down below.